Okay, we're going to get started. Dave Wink is going to be talking about biochemistry of redox species, but he's coming down from Frederick and he may have run into a little traffic on I-270. So we're going to start with Stefan. And Stefan, he's a senior investigator in the Laboratory of Human Carcinogenesis. He's head of the Molecular Epidemiology section. And you'll see from his accent that he was educated in Germany. And he got his PhD in 1992 from the University of Würzburg. Subsequently, he came to NCI, and he's been a tenure track investigator since 2001. He was tenured in 2010. The title of his talk, Contribution of Oxidative Stress to Human Cancer, Evidence from Cancer Epidemiology. Stefan. Okay, thank you so much for the uh, introduction. Thank you for coming. So yeah, um, I will um, you know look at the uh, um, the relationship between oxidative stress and cancer, or cancer development from a kind of a different angle, not from from a laboratory stand, standpoint or more. What we, what evidence do we get out as studying a population? And uh, when we studying a population, we usually cannot study mechanisms. So what we really do, we do we look at exposures and association with disease. And what I want to, to tell you, what kind of evidence we, do we have out of a, a population studies that oxidative stress is really important in disease development. Um, while we do not have mechanism and we cannot really conclude that link um, exposures to a disease development out of epidemiology, you can always have a confounding kind of an uh, observation. It's still very important to have um, uh, evidence from epidemiology. You know, when we do experiments with cell culture, with animals, we may get beautiful results. You know, we have and we use something, throw it on a cell, it transforms the cell, the cell gets more aggressive, we do it with animals, we get the tumors and we say, oh man, this is a really important compound and causes cancer. And then uh, usually after people did those initial observations, uh, epidemiologists get interested in it and say, okay, let's study it in the population if we can. We cannot always, but sometimes we can very well. And then they ask hey, how it's linked to a disease and there is no linkage. And uh, this may have something to do that there is really no linkage. Second, it may have something to do that in a population you don't have the concentration. You just don't achieve it. So that is not an important uh, link. And uh, you know what excites people so much in the laboratory um, you know, for human disease, that's just not uh, um, um, so important. Um, which could be a, a, you know, in, um, disappointing for the one who does the, 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 um, the research, but it's really important for society to know those kind of things. Because um, yeah, it's a limited out of, uh, 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 um, amount of money, and we have the money we have to use. We have uh, to make our decisions how we um, um, go, first, how we communicate with the population, and you know how we try to protect. And by, by by protecting the population, we have to set priorities. You know where we get the best impact out of our money. Um, okay, good. So, uh, what is the evidence that uh, oxidative stress is linked to cancer? Um, I will um, go through uh, first a little bit in the uh, um, um, introduction. Is you know here are the hallmarks of cancer as it was described between for by Hannah and Weinberg uh, about ten years a little more uh, um, ago. They had these kind of hallmarks. It is common to you know to most cancers, and they, this um, 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 kind of um, um, you know schematic was then modified several times. Here it was modified in 2009, and they, they uh, uh, added new hallmarks to it. And one hallmark that was added is now oxidative stress, um, saying that um, the production of reactive oxygen species is usually up in cancer. And, um, and one important mechanism, what it does is that you, uh, it gets DNA damage. It can be uh, up in a precancerous lesion, and it leads to cancer, or it can be up in cancer, and it leads to cancer progression. So it's very important, and um, um, at least out of experimental systems. And then there's a question, uh, how is it important in a population? What causes ox oxidative stress in a, in a population? And if there is an excessive production, how it's linked to disease, and how can we interfere, prevent? Um, and here again, you know, how do we get uh, increased oxidative stress in a cell, in an organ, uh, what are important factors? Growth factors are very important. Dietary factors that we believe are important. 
And then it's actually also disease metabolism, metabolism like diabetes leads to changes where we get increased production of uh, reactive oxygen species in mitochondria, or we uh, activate an enzyme, the NADPH oxidase. Then we get these um, reactive oxygen species. They can cause damage, as I just said, cause damage DNA, protein, or lipids. But it can actually also work as signaling molecule, secondary messenger. And it's very nicely shown. This here I see NF kappa B in using kinase. You get upregulation of NF kappa B. Here are other mechanisms that are all also lead uh, to upregulation. Uh, increased transcriptional activity of NF kappa B. That's what you get. And NF kappa B is really um, the classic tran um, transcription factor that medi mediates the, well, the oncogenic function of, um, of inflammation. And there's another pathway that actually leads then uh, to a similar uh, uh, activation of AP1 signal and other transcription factor. Um, that's all from um, um, molecular studies. Then we also know now, um, okay, that uh, NIF2 is just as the opposite kind of activates the cell uh, antioxidant response um, is another transcription factor. You see how complex it is. It's regulated. It was supposed to be a tumor suppressor. Okay, you say uh, oxidative stress is uh, pro-tumorogenic. You have something that protects cells from oxidative stress. It should be a tumor suppressor. Uh, but it turns out, and I cannot go into details, it's true in many situations, but sometimes NF, uh, uh, NFR2 upregulation is oncogenic. Uh, and this, yeah, in this talk, you will see it many times, and I'll make many times the point that we think something works a certain way, and uh, when we have the data, it sometimes works just the other way. Um, what we also have in cancer is really the consistent up, uh, down regulation of um, antioxidant enzymes, it's shown here, and uh, glycine peroxidase, and then uh, upregulation of prooxidant enzymes like cyclooxygenase 2 and nitric oxide synthase 2. And David, when he comes, will talk about this. So what we have is really, and what I said, you know, hallmark of cancer, uh, prooxidant state is common in cancer cells. Uh, many cancers poorly metabolize hydrogen peroxide, which is, which on one side, uh, you know, um, can cause damage, but it's also um, really a signaling molecule. And this uh, concentration of these metabolites are increased in cancer. And this is actually old stuff. Um, so, um, so that's kind of, uh, um, you know, what sets the point why uh, people, uh, um, population scientists, have uh, got an, an interest in studying oxidative stress in human populations. So, as I said, uh, usually we do molecular and cellular research and animal studies that we start out with. Uh, then there's also nutritional research, and that's many times observations here then are followed up by observational studies, and when observational studies are positive, we may decide to put money in the intervention trials. Um, and uh, it's the most expensive kind of a study, but also most conclusive. And then uh, this is an, uh, uh, here all looks at the relation between oxidative, uh, oxidative and cancer, and we can look at disease onset, how it influences disease onset. We can also ask how it does it uh, uh, influence uh, disease progression. And the effects on disease onset and progression may be very different. Maybe just opposite, actually, uh, in survival. So uh, in epidemiology, what do you, what do you study? Um, you know, we, we have certainly the evidence from um, um, experimental research that certain exposure, the function or uh, signal to oxidative stress, so epidemiology looks at infection and chronic inflammation, environmental factors, occupational factors, uh, assuming um, there's signaling through oxidative stress, and then we look at uh, now it is related to disease, and today we are interested in cancer, how it's related to cancer. And then we also are interested how diet is, in, in, is uh, related to cancer. In, in part, some diets will increase oxidative stress, others actually uh, will um, are protective, will decrease it. And uh, then we want to see how these diets are actually related to disease, and then perhaps make recommendation to uh, to the uh, to the public. So, and then uh, you know these are factors we can we, we want to say we can modify it. We get information, and uh, uh, if there are strong association, we start uh, communicating with a uh, with a public and tell them, yeah, well, or uh, with, uh, with lawmakers uh, how we can restrict. Um, certain exposure or how we can change behaviors in the population. But then there's also uh, perhaps uh, predisposition, predisposition, that's not so easy to deal with. 
um, if, if we are lucky, we can develop therapies. Uh, but is there um, evidence that oxidative uh, damage can also be caused by uh, uh, inherited predisposition? The answer is yes. There are some high risk diseases like Wilson's disease and hereditary uh, hemochromatosis, where we know that um, um, germline mutations they cause these diseases, and the people who develop these diseases are predisposed to cancer. And um, yeah, uh, in many ways, you know, um, we just know that. Uh, and it gives us evidence that oxidative stress is really weird. And that's really what it, this is an um, copper uh, uh, overload disease, an iron overload disease. Perez Hussein, who is coming next, next time, he will talk a little bit more, more about it. Um, and we, um, and it's many other um, conditions develop. We, uh, is it, and there are therapies that are so and so good. We, and cancer is just one of them. It's really hard to deal with here uh, um, uh, in, in, that we can prevent it, even we have that information. That's many times with inherited disease. We know how it works, but it's not so easy to treat it. Um, and then there is moder um, low moderate risk factors, genetic risk factors. These are um, usually single nucleotide polymorphisms. There are other variations in our genome. That makes everyone for uh, me different from you, and I, it, everyone from us here in the room is different somewhat from the other person. Uh, some of these uh, genetic variants um, affect functions of, of genes um, and uh, can actually, in extreme cases, lead to a knockout of function. And people have studied these genetic variants and how these genetic variants relate to diseases uh, like cancer. Um, then here's just one, uh, one example. We, here they use and design, it's called genomic association studies, where you, uh, this, uh, where you study almost all known uh, genetic variations at one time. You really don't uh, study all, but you have to, you need, you use SNPs that are linked to many uh, disease related ones. And then um, um, and, uh, the, by doing so, they identify uh, genetic susceptibility loci for diseases here, ulcerative colitis, and they did. And they know that many of these variations affecting genes that regulate immunity and autoimmunity are um, related to alternative colitis. That means uh, when you are very unlucky and you carry a certain number of those genetic traits that increase your risk, you are really at an increased risk of alternative colitis. But usually this, this kind of um, genetic variation, they confer only a low risk of, uh, of, the, of the disease to an individual person. It's mere on a population level. So um, these SNPs are common in the population and um, um, uh, may explain that you have, you have 5,000 per year uh, in a population who develop a disease and may explain 500 on those cases. And then we know, we can now say, well, we have an explanation for 10% of the cancers why they uh, develop in, in a population. We may not be able to use that information for anything to prevent, but at least we have an explanation for it. Okay, um, and we, when, uh, we started years ago one SNP uh, um, that was is in the MNSOD gene, manganese suboxate dismutase. Uh, it's an, uh, it, um, that SNP leads to an exchange of amino acid. When you have the ALA, when the enzyme has the ALA uh, um, um, uh, um, amino acid, uh, then it's uh, more um, located in the, in the matrix of mitochondria. When it has a valine, it's more located, it's more membrane bound, so it's a different loca location. And people think it affects the, um, the activity of, uh, or, um, it affects uh, the way how MNSOD can detoxify um, radicals. And we found that um, breast cancer patients who had um, uh, 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 two alleles of the alanine, so you know, uh, all the MNSOD that is produced is, um, uh, as, an, as an enzyme is, uh, it carries ALA, they had actually poorer survival than the other ones, and we could link it to therapy. Uh, we had the, uh, our data indicated that they are not responding as well to a certain type of therapy than these ones here. Can be important. Uh, information you can use it then to develop a test, and, um, and, and you know, and when you give people a, um, patients that 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 um, that, uh, um, that therapy, and you know, people co confirm that everything research has to be confirmed, and they can confirm that, and there is really a big difference uh, between those with um, one um, 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 genotype versus the other. You develop a test, then you to determine first before you treat a patient. What is their genotype? And then if they have a genotype that don't, does not respond to therapy, you will not use the therapy. That's ideal. Okay, good. 
So let's go to cancer causes worldwide. Um, what causes cancer? There's estimation that nutrition uh, is associated with 30 to 35 percent. Second is tobacco exposure, chronic infection, high penetrance genes. When you would look at uh, um, um, uh, mortality, cancer mortality, tobacco would be number one uh, because tobacco causes a lot of very deadly cancers. Nutrition, it's um, yeah, good. It's uh, you can say it's individual choices, bad choice of of, of a diet. But then it's it's not so easy. It's of course also um, a more um, you so, uh, yeah, traditional um, um, you know um, um, nutrition um, diet choices for area that is not so easy to change. Um, and here in, 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 in the US or Europe, we have our Western style diet, what we think is a uh, high risk diet when it comes to cancer risk. Um, so that's not something uh, you, you can really pinpoint to an individual uh, choice. Um, okay, so uh, how do we, how have we linked nutrition? How do we know that nutrition uh, influences, um, uh, or, you know, uh, yeah, cancer, dic dictate influence cancer risk? It came actually out originally from migration studies, so it was the most most convincing evidence where actually uh, people from low risk, um, um, low risk cancer areas migrated into the United States and um, adopted the, um, the cancer risk of the United States. It was in, you know, 10, 20 years afterwards, you knew that they had increased risk. And uh, in the second generation still also has an increase risk and then it continued. So you knew that it cannot be genetic, it's too quick, it is the environment. Um, then we have the association studies that is just to go into the population and you study uh, um, exposure, how the exposure relates to risk. You can use case control studies, you can use prospective studies, which are much better, but much more expo uh, uh, expensive. And then uh, ultimately you can use intervention trials. And from all these, we got, uh, um, we got to categorize when it relates to cancer foods into two categories where high intake. Of, the, of those foods lead to a low risk of cancer, and it's these ones here, or where a high intake, intake of these foods lead to a high risk of cancer. And all these, and it's, I think it's really clear for those ones that reduce risk, one would say they have their antioxidants. So that's really, just by looking at them, you would say, well, that's probably one of their function. Um, and that's how, the, how people really got interested and say, and, you know, it's that really, yeah, um, that oxidative stress is something important in, in disease development. Uh, and we modulate it with our, uh, with our diet. And if we have the right diet, you know, what, one thing we really change is we reduce oxidative stress. And this is also why, you know, um, the vitamin industry came so into being, <laughs> because we believe when we take certain vitamins, we uh, reduce oxidative stress. Um, and then is um, good evidence from uh, animal research. Uh, here is what just one publication, Western style diet was fed to mice. And this is the Western side that is, um, uh, um, is, is shown here. And then they looked at the colon and they found that um, there are changes in the colon depending on the diet. And this is just one example. There are lots of papers. And um, uh, what the changes is when you have the Western side diet concentration of redox sensitive biochemical gets up. So that indicates that there is inflammation, oxidative stress. And then you have also these. Um, Infiltration of macrophages, therefore, probably partly um, responsible for the oxidative stress. So, yeah, there are clear changes, changes that indicate diet um, um, uh, in, uh, increases oxidative stress. So, then, um, um, so people did a lot of studies looking at diet in relation to cancer. I just summarize it here a little. I'll give you a brief background. So, in the 70s and 80s, a lot of people did case control studies. And in those case control studies, and, and looked at cancer. And they reported, oh, well, there's a lot of food that's associated with cancer. And that was pretty clear that uh, um, you eat veggies and you eat uh, fruits, you have a decreased risk. And then certain other foods like um, um, the different kind of meats, uh, and as I said, they are clearly um, associated with an increased risk. Now, this was, um, the, at that time, people used um, a design is called case control. You give questions to people who have developed the disease and people who have not developed the disease. And then you ask, uh, what's, the in, uh, what's the frequency of an exposure in this population, and then you make association how that relates to disease. That's one problem is that people who have developed the disease remember an exposure differently than the controls. And that was probably a, a, a reason for um, this epidemic of data that um, people generated at that time. And then when, we, when the case control studies produced nice data, people said, okay, it's time to put money in better studies, and it's prospective studies. 
and you enroll a whole population, maybe 100,000 people, and I have to follow them up for 10, 15, 20 years, because cancer is a rare disease. And in order to get enough cancers in your population, you need a huge, huge um, a population, still you have to follow it up over a long time. But it's too expensive, and then you have the power to analyze it. And when people started looking at prospective studies, many of these associations didn't come out no more. And they'd be, oh, well, what do, do we do wrong? People worked on their questionnaire, on, and even larger studies. Yeah, well, people did not confirm um, uh, most of the initial findings. So yeah, I give you just something. It seems to be, uh, you know, that is some conclusions that seem to be uh, just correct here. Colorectal cancer uh, uh, characterized a high intake of red and processed meats and decreased uh, uh, diets labeled as healthy in a meta analysis. So say, yeah, well, uh, you cannot just say you look at the at uh, individual food component and link it to cancer. But when you uh, um, lo uh, look at foods overall, uh, foods overall from the survey and you group them and then see how it relates to cancer, it's true that um, this old paradigm of uh, high protective food, um, low risk, uh, um, low intake of high risk food, it really helps you to avoid um, a colon cancer. Uh, dietary um, um, fibers and colorectal cancer. That was something that always came forward. And, you know, you are always told you should take uh, fiber-rich food. This didn't work out at all, not, not in the epidemiology and also not in, uh, in, in intervention trials. Uh, it's not clear why not. Uh, people still believe it's true. Or, um, you know, what, is, uh, don't we do, whether we don't do right in the assessment of it. Then fruits and veg vegetables intake in breast cancer. Uh, this has been also linked to many other cancer, but in general, you know, when you really look at it, and, uh, uh, and even when you look at, at the individual um, um, of fruit or veggies, people have a very hard time to look at the cancer. It's a good study. The, the, uh, the associations are weak. Um, and um, then the same, the two, the same is true with vitamins. Um, um, and I can give you even more, more data. Uh, no, it's not well linked to cancer risk. Uh, and here again, so overall, uh, what we saw, we had it, we had clear risk association now with better studies. We know there are only few components in food uh, diets that can be linked to cancer. One is alcohol and breast cancer. There's a clear, a beautiful um, uh, um, 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 co correlation. Uh, those, and it has never been, uh, you know, there was no controversy between study and study, but others, mm. So, okay. Uh, I will not go into more um, Then it's not just uh, what kind of food you eat, it's also um, how much you eat of it or when, how much you eat and then what is your lifestyle, you have a sedentary lifestyle, then you may develop all, uh, overweight and obesity and this has uh, increased over time, that was in the newspaper many, many times, uh, that um, the population gets obese and um, predisposes people to, to disease mainly cardiovascular disease, but also cancer. And I will also, you know, this in, only look at uh, the cancer side. And then actually turned out in, in the US population, it's just not, it's not homogeneous, it's also the population group. For example, African-Americans are more affected by these, um, by the detrimental um, impact of, the, of diet um, um, in the United States and the European Americans. So they, here, um, um, these changes or you know the increase in obesity really um, gives them a, a, even a higher risk for disease and disease like cancer. And how does it work? Why, why do I bring in obesity? Because obesity has, sleep, has been linked to systemic inflammation. Uh, um, here's how it works. You know um, um, what were signaling molecules that are more abundant during a, a obesity. And again, we get we get to the same point. It activates as NF kappa B and AP1. And uh, really, um, you know, leads to a signaling, a pro-inflammatory signaling. This is also pro-oncogenic. And we have um, um, systemic inflammation again, just all over in our body. Here are the examples, uh, liver. Then here we have the, uh, the muscle. Then we have blood vessels. And then we have here the pancreas. You have a systemic inflammation. You can actually really measure it with, with markers. You put blood and you measure um, uh, inflammation marker in blood and compare obese versus overweight versus non-overweight, you find a difference. Um, so, and then, uh, yeah, how does it relate to cancer? You know, um, in 2004, this paper came out. It gave us an estimate uh, of how uh, uh, being overweight or obese relates to cancer risk. And they made the point about 10 to 20% of all cancer deaths in the United States are actually explained by obesity. So that was a pretty high estimate. It's now a little lower. 
Um, so, but it's, it contributes to it, and uh, here are just the cancers listed here from women and men. It's different in the, uh, the relationship by, by gender. And, uh, you know, here are, you can see as high as the relative risk is, as, as, as more associated is um, obesity or, or being overweight with, with the risk to develop this type of cancer. So, you know, lots of cancers are really, um, 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 you know, related to, uh, to obesity. And you would say, yeah, this is something you can change and you change just cancer risk, but it turns out it's not so easy, you know. <laughs> um, and here's a, um, a paper that came actually out of the NCID Division of Cancer Epidemiology in 2010 that looked at the um, um, risk of death from uh, various causes, cancer, cardiovascular disease, and other, and then here, when you look at cancer, here, um, 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 a BMI of 22.5 to 25 is, is a reference. Uh, and here, sees when you, as, as you have a um, um, higher BMI, your risk increases. So when you uh, have a relative risk of one, uh, it would be, there is no increase, 1.05 one, one means a 5% risk increase, 34% risk in is 47. So yeah, the yeah, cancer risk increases with increasing weight. Um, and so this has been confirmed, there's no question. Um, okay, so, and then it is a question yet, yeah, now, how is that linked obesity to, to cancer? So one, one is that you, obesity by itself cause, causes chronic inflammation, but in, 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 with overweight and obese, you're also more likely to develop um, certain other metabolic diseases, this, uh, the, um, uh, diseases like diabetes, People started getting interested of whether perhaps drugs that you use to treat these comorbidities may also be good in treating cancer. And one candidate that came out of it was metformin. Um, that is a drug that um, um, decreases um, glu glucose secretion by the liver. Uh, it has it targets mitochondria, so it re reduces uh, uh, oxygen radical production. Uh, it also um, um, reduces signaling by in insulin, like growth factor and insulin. And people now testing it, uh, um, um, whether metformin actually can be used to treat cancer. Uh, and there was originally a pretty good um, 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 association, you know, initial study said, yeah, yeah, it's probably it really will work. Turned out, well, it's not, not so sure, but here are two cancers that are really uh, probably in, in part prevented. It's colon on, on, on prostate cancer, where actually when you use metformin, you may get a benefit. Um, so something has been learned out of epidemiology. And this and, uh, has been followed up um, um, with other studies. And now metformin is, been, is being tested in clinical trials. Uh, okay, good. So what is, now let's go to individual cancer sites. What is the evidence that um, um, certain cancers are really linked to um, oxygen radical production, oxidative stress? It's strong for lung cancer. And there is lots of information. Um, in, in, when you uh, analyze urine samples, you can look at DNA damage products and you see it, it's increased in urine samples from smokers. Uh, we know tobacco smoke has a lot of reactive oxygen uh, uh, um, generating compounds, uh, induces monocyte recruitment and activation that leads to inflammation. And then here induces cytochrome P450s and, uh, and reactive oxygen as byproducts of, of cytochrome P450 metabolism, metabolism of um, uh, um, um, tobacco um, products. And then we know that asbestos, is, which is a risk factor for lung cancer, also causes, uh, causes persistent inflammation. Radon, which has been linked to, um, to, to lung cancer, we know uh, definitely a risk factor, also works through uh, production of oxyreticals. And then we know also that certain chronic inflammatory uh, conditions are linked to an increased lung cancer risk. And everything has, all of them has in common one thing, that there's uh, yeah, increased formation oxyradicals. So people said, well, that's an important um, mechanism. When we protect against it, can we protect against lung cancer? Uh, and I told you I will show you so, uh, a good number of um, data that um, are just the opposite of what people expected. Uh, here they are, um, people, but because they thought the evidence is really um, so strong, we go in intervention trials. And they did very large intervention trials. And <laughs> these trials all were negative or even harmful. So when you took um, the vitamins that you thought they would, would um, protect against oxyradical damage, it had no effects, or actually you were at higher risk. Um, people you know, had a hard time to grab with it you know, and find an explanation. Pretty soon it became clear that pharmaceutical dose of antioxidants that are apparently non-toxic 
uh, bioactive compounds in the general population that what people assume they have uh, adverse effects in high risk uh, in, in, in individuals with high risk behavior. Uh, so when, when you have um, when you smoke an alcohol intake, that was one one of the explanations. And then um, a paper came out in 2014. A group from Sweden just followed it up, and they went into um, uh, animal model, lung cancer animal model, and said, you know, just treat animals with antioxidants and see what happens. And they used a model where, where, uh, for lung cancer driven by KRAS mutation and under a BRAF uh, mutation, and asked, you know, what does uh, treatment of these animals with n acetylcysteine do? And to their surprise, and consistent with the uh, prevention trials, <laughs> they got more tumors. They got more tumors, and they got it with an acetyl and vitamin E. And it, this here just shows you that um, um, survival, those who are treated with uh, antioxidants, those animals had a, had a short, clearly shorter survival. And then uh, they did a, a, a number of different, uh, and they showed that when you, um, 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 when cells get these antioxidants, it reduces reactive oxygen species, good. It reduced DNA damage, good. But what it also did, it reduced P53 expression. And then they did some experiments, you know, where they show when you knock out P53, you get an increased growth of cells. And when you uh, treat um, cells with knockout P53 and these with wild type, they all come together at one point that they all have a higher um, proliferation here. And the kind of the, what, what a point they made, and I don't know whether it's absolutely uh, correct is, um, under the condition, these animals get um, um, n acetylcysteine uh, they behave like they have a P53 mutation. It's not functional no more. And they thought that that's very important for cancer progression. Okay, good. But overall, uh, afterwards, after the trial was, 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 was done and was negative, people did animal studies and said, well, it makes sense. <laughs> uh, okay, colorectal cancer. What do we know? I, I give you, for all of these cancers, a lot of evidence, but I give you only for some um, 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 examples where we really have good evidence. That's a really nice example that uh, um, inflammation and oxidative stress is probably very important in the development of the disease in a human population is colon cancer because non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs, they really de de decrease the risk consistently. Again, all the studies. We, interesting, with the exception of the first one we've ever done, <laughs> all the other ones show when you have a relative risk of one, uh, uh, that would mean there's no effect. When, when, when the risk is at 0 0.5, that means the treatment, when it goes down here, treatment protects. When um, the relative risk goes to 1.5, it means it increases risk. The first actually indicated that non-steroid and inflammatory drugs increase the risk. All other studies since then show it's a clear reduction. There's no question that there's up to 50% reduction of colon cancer risk when you take the regular use of it. And lots of people really say you should use it when you can use it. When it doesn't make you a problem, use it. Um, it's good um, to protect you against cancer. Uh, some estimates that say people who can use non-steroid and inflammatory drugs without side effects may gain, uh, on average, over two year lifespan. Um, that's what you get in the populations with, with cancer, cardiovascular disease. Um, so, in, uh, and here is also another study that looked at um, aspirin use in the population, huge population. Um, and um, here are the ones um, that did, did not use aspirin. And here are the ones that used aspirin. And over time, here, the, over time you see really how these curves divert and um, there, is, uh, there are fewer deaths in those who um, um, use aspirin. Uh, it's clearly protective, there's no question. So um, I, we, uh, my group got recently actually interested in aspirin and, colo uh, and prostate cancer. So aspirin is really good for, to prevent colon cancer. All the other cancers is so-and-so, maybe 10, 20% reduction of cancer risk. Uh, so um, for individual person, hey, I could, what comes out of it? You may say, that, is that really something I want to do? Uh, and the same is true for prostate cancer. Um, but what we had observed, so we are interested in prostate cancer among African-American men. Prostate cancer in African-American develops more commonly and is more aggressive. And we had done, in, uh, we published in 2008 a, a, a study where we uh, looked at prostate tumors of the African and European, European-American men, compared them and said, what's different? One thing was different is that the prostate tumors of the African American men had an immune inflammation signature. And what in this is actually an interferon signature. We still don't know why, 
It's just interesting, many are viral infection response seen and they are upregulated in the tumors of the African-American men. But see, certainly there was an immune inflammation. Inflammation, we said man, maybe that's chronic inflammation. And we have, um, we brought a uh, case control study into the field. It's in Baltimore, uh, was recently completed. We enrolled African-American, European-American patients and, and controls. And then we looked at aspirin, relationship of aspirin with uh, prostate cancer. And we were especially interested, interested how is aspirin used um, associated with aggressive disease? Because I told you that in, the signature was in tumors. So when it's there, the next question is, is it, does it um, uh, causes disease progression? And you can prevent disease progression with an anti-inflammatory drug. Does it, does it do something? Um, uh, aspirin um, um, is so and so good in European Americans in, um, in um, preventing the, um, um, the, um, um, the disease progression. This was known from the literature. It's something we also found. There's really no relationship. But look what happens here in the African American desert. We find in our study a huge reduction. It's the first study who ever did that. So it would actually um, um, uh, um, decrease the risk of progression by 70%. So that would fit to our um, hypothesis that there is something different in the tumor and it's inflammation. So um, yeah, good, we were writing up the manuscript now, but just that you see him. So uh, maybe aspirin works somewhere else. Uh, so, uh, and here you see something else. Here we looked at disease um, recurrence. Among African-American patients, here are the ones who are regular aspirin users, and here they are not regular. And you see the disease, how it, the survival fraction how disease like occurs in those who have, are not regular aspirin users. So it's a real difference. So we, for our data, we would say, well, they should use it when they have a disease diagnosis. It could particularly be important for them because it has that inflammation in the process. But again, well, I, to all these studies, when you do it in population, it has to be repeated. Because in population, there can always be a bias. You just don't know. Or you have a special population and it doesn't reflect the general population. And that's why in, 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 in epidemiology you say, why do people it again and again and again? You need it. You really need it to make sure it's not an artifact. Because at the end, you really make a recommendation to the public and you better make sure that's a good recommendation. Uh, and I think that's also an you know, important point with diet. It was probably not good that people alarmed, uh, um, now that researchers alarmed people, you know, how bad diets are. And at the end, it turns out it's not that bad, you know, <laughs> it's not true our data. It's, um, it's not a good communication of research results uh, because afterwards people don't believe you no more. <laughs> so, uh, and I think that that's also, in, and that's good in science in general. People do much better studies now. The um, uh, reviewers are much more critical. We study design. Uh, people are much more willing to give more money for better design studies so that you can believe the data. Uh, and, um, you know, 30 years ago, we maybe have not, we didn't know, or, you know, we didn't have that experience uh, uh, that, you, that you communicate the wrong thing. All right, so next, chronic infections are linked to, um, 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 to cancer, 10 to 20% here. That percentage probably will is going to go down. Tobacco will go up because now tobacco use uh, increases everywhere in Asia, in, in Africa. Uh, it will be the cause of cancer will probably go up 30 or 40 percent on infectious disease because there is better hygiene all over the place. It probably goes down. Uh, but still, viruses cause about 10 to 15 percent of all cancers worldwide. You know, when you have chronic HPV and chronic HCV, uh, you are at high risk of developing liver cancer. Um, and um, HPV goes and cervical cancer, so that's clear on the risk. Bacteria actually also cause some cancers, and parasites less than 1%. And here's just an example, uh, the linkage of certain viruses with certain um, uh, cancer sites, where we really know that there is a causative, there's a causative relationship. So yeah, how do you get to a causative relationship in, uh, um, in a population? It's first that you have consistent evidence from epidemiology uh, that an, uh, something and exposure is linked to the disease. Second, that when you do, when you do your uh, studies in cell culture and animals, it confirms it. And then uh, uh, when you have it all together, and then also usually in epidemiology, you, there are certain criteria, it's those relationship and all kinds of, or that the, that the exposure preceded the disease and so on. When you have that in study after study, then we have convincing evidence, and then we say something is a human carcinogen. Um, and these are confirmed ones. Uh, Heliobacter pylori, it was surprising how long it took to link it to gastric cancer, and, you know. 
So, yeah, what can you do, Helio Bacter pylori? Yeah, yeah, treat it, you know, when you have the infection. Um, these ones, uh, viruses is not so easy to treat, but these ones, you know, you can really have treatments. And then when the exposure goes away, the cancer risk goes down. So um, it's helpful and make a really difference in certain populations. Okay, good. And then uh, something, and then you, we are all here at human microbiome. Yeah, human microbiome is not really an infection. It's something we have. Uh, this is a, 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 a commensal uh, a, a community. It's either neutral, can be ben, a benefit. But then people observed when they looked at disease, uh, when, uh, uh, what I also, it, when it's extremely diverse to analyze it. <laughs> it's huge. But what people observed is when they looked at disease, there, there is what, uh, something happened, what people call a dysbiosis. There's loss of those bacteria you usually have and gain of pathogenic mi microbes. So there's a shift in the population. In sec and then uh, generally you have a loss of diversity in, in a, is a characteristic of the disease state. So fewer, fewer bacteria, fewer family members, uh, and then uh, uh, ones that we would say they are pathogenic. And this is just here, you, you may go to and, and read this um, review. Yeah, it's just an example, got the controls, patients, certain disease, how um, families of bacteria, how they colonize the healthy ones, and then the patient is totally changed. So but then when you have such an observation, it's of course always the same, like this epidemiology is, this is just an association. You can have the disease and th that's why it happened. Well, it may not do nothing, it's just there. Or you have it, um, you see it at the same time, and you develop disease because you had a dysbiosis before. You have to prove that. And then uh, another thing is you have the disease, you have the dysbiosis, you can ask, what does it do to disease progression? Can it still be very important? So these are the questions you, are, you ask when you have this kind of observations. Now, um, uh, for um, the microbiome, people have really done very elegant studies in animals, animal models, uh, to show really that um, um, uh, dysbiosis is not just uh, uh, occurs together with disease, uh, with a disease, with disease change. No, it participates in disease development or causes a more aggressive disease. Here's an example. This was from New England Journal of Medicine that um, um, the genetic mutation you acquire it, then um, your epithelium, your colon epithelium becomes leaky. The bacteria can now translocate from the lumen to the abdomen. And then here on the other side, it activates immune cells and the immune cells uh, secrete inflammatory markers and that activates STAT3. And STAT3 activation is something you don't want to have, especially not in, in cells that have acquired mutation because this is pro-oncogenic and that's exactly what they, what they had in their, their model, that it leads to a cell survival and prol proliferation of initiated cells and, and contributes to progression. So here, uh, um, the um, dysbiosis would uh, contribute to disease progression. <clears throat> and then here are uh, several other um, really interesting paper. Here's a paper that says that dysbiosis uh, predisposes mice to colitis and then uh, colitis associated uh, colorectal cancer. But really the important part of this paper was it's transmissible. One animal has it, the other animal when it didn't have it and it lives together with that animal gets also the dysbiosis. Uh, then here, um, these, these people looked at liver cancer, uh, identified deoxygenate as a bile acid, a bile acid that is in their model produced related to obesity and, and it's known by gut, uh, as a gut my, microbial my, meta, metabolite. And they showed when you have that produced, it will promote liver cancer by a certain mechanism. And when you block the production of um, deoxygenate, you prevent HCC in their model. And now you have to show that it is important in humans too. Uh, I know people have looked at it, they cannot find it. Um, and then here's another liver cancer model, uh, which they show that uh, LPS that is produced uh, by the microbiome in the gut is important in promoting uh, uh, liver calcogenesis in this model because of uh, uh, TLF4 signaling. Something what David does. <laughs> so, okay, and then here, um, it's just uh, to, uh, an end to it. Here's an, um, an, a study that showed really that um, the, um, the bacteria or families of bacteria change very much in disease here in colon tumors. There were a certain family um, becomes abundant uh, in, um, in tumors um, uh, of cancer patients, colon cancer patients. And then here on the other side, when you, when you would go in, into this review, they, this review discusses how different bacteria, this different pathogenic bacteria um, cause uh, 
you know, um, accelerate disease progression cause uh, disease by certain mechanism. It's from one bacterium to, one can, to, an, uh, to another can be different. Uh, and also an explanation how this bacterium here may cause uh, disease progression here, they say, by activation of the wind signaling pathway. Uh, so uh, clearly, um, um, so, so human, human microbiome, if it goes to alteration that are disease associated, may promote cancer on cancer progression. And then last, the other cause uh, where, you know, um, uh, oxidative stress may contribute to cancer development. The, the, it's a really good example is skin cancer. Uh, people are, among skin cancers, people are really interested in melanomas because they are deadly. Yeah, the skin cancers don't do none. You just cut them out. Uh, melanoma, how do you get them? Uh, UVB, it leads to really very, um, you know, distinct uh, DNA um, um, adducts and to CC to TT transitions. You have actually no, well, very rarely in any other cancers, just in, in, in skin-related cancer, and it's really a signature of UVB radiation. And then it's also, um, there's also good evidence that um, um, uh, UVA uh, produces oxyreticals in, in, in that same environment where you get this mutation, and it's the promoter of uh, cancer progression. And that skin, people know a lot about skin cancer. There were always two models where people are, uh, 40, 50 years ago, studied cancer, to understand cancer. It was a liver cancer model uh, where we treated animals with carcinogens and see what happens in, in the liver in the skin cancer model, and where they have these, uh, you know, the two-stage model where you gave certain carcinogens to by skin, you painted it on it, the liver, you gave it with the food, then you had the initiator, and then you had carcinogens. When you gave them alone, they didn't cause cancer, but when you gave first an initiator, and then you gave those, then the cancer progressed very quickly. So we learned a lot. So these are old models, but already with the old models, one of them was uh, um, uh, four ball esters. Uh, the people really knew early on that only those in this family who that stimulate superoxide, uh, superoxide production are active in tumor promotion, the ones who don't, didn't uh, uh, um, cause uh, um, cancer progression or development into cancer from a precancerous lesion. So that they, they all said, okay, that must be very important to have these oxyreticals. Um, and then um, Ross in, um, in cancer progression. Uh, yeah, yeah, sure, clearly. So people, people believe in it. It's very important. And they think that NF kappa B signaling is very important. This is actually why we would like to be able to target NF kappa B signaling. Uh, lots of people believe you target it successfully in cancer. Uh, that would be one of the way for therapies. Unfortunately, it doesn't work well because of the uh, severe side effects. Um, um, so, um, and then here also activators, there are lots of activators of uh, NF-kappa B uh, uh, pathway that's associated with cancer progression. Um, but then came out, it's really interesting, you know what I thought, this surprising result. So we, I, I made the point here, skin cancer, melanoma, oxidative stress, everybody believed in it. Um, and uh, it's also very important in cancer progression disease and certainly also in melanoma. And then two papers came out, this is from 2015, Antioxidants can increase melanoma metastasis in mice. And that was the second paper that came out. It was published in Nature. And they, again, surprising results. You, you know, we said oxidative stress is very important in, uh, in melanoma and in the progression. And here you give um, antioxidants. And in this model, you get less lymph node metastasis and then metastasis when you, and you get more when you have an antioxidant. And uh, it's, 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 it, it makes all the same point. Uh, surprising result is just the opposite. Now, people who cause scrabble have to explain. Um, and that's uh, many times in research, you know, we learn and we learn. It's, we, 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 we have an idea, okay, it's straightforward, and then we may be more sophisticated model and it comes out just the opposite. All right. So, it's but still, here's a summary. There's good evidence that oxidative stress is involved in human cancer causation and promotes disease progression. Um, um, in, for my, my part was really that environmental exposures cause it, and then you get that uh, that linkage. And I think it, 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 that is, you know, if, uh, but epidemiology has not succeeded in linking specific antioxidants to reduce cancer birth. So it's more today people really believe you have to assess an individual more broader. So um, when you have a survey, don't go question by question and link, you know, the exposure question by question. Uh, uh, put it together in scores and perhaps take survey question and then you take biomarkers. You go also in blood and in urine, markers that uh, uh, report inflammation, in, 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 uh, report oxidative burden. 
take a, a variety of markers all together because they uh, um, um, report different things and then you uh, report a sum score. And with all together, you start then uh, classifying um, subjects in who has a uh, high um, um, oxyretical burden, who is not. Maybe we are then better in classifying um, subjects and then we are also better in leading it to disease. So and this is done, you know, it just costs more money, you know. <laughs> That's that's a problem. Uh, why why it, so? Okay, good. So I so I'm still optimistic. All right, uh, because I do the research, <laughs> and then knowledge of uh, uh, tumor redox biology for better prevention strategies and new treatment options. All right, you know, I just gave you an example. We had the, uh, that observation with prostate tumors um, in 2008. Well, what, what do we do? And then uh, we, we, we co completed our case control study. And this first thing we did, we looked at aspirin in relation to. Uh, Disease. This was our first because we had that observation. And what it does protect, maybe it's useful. You know? So that's how you, and that also shows you um, the power in combining basic research with observational research. Uh, you know, it's always the best thing. Um, I know it's, uh, uh, it's not so easy to do, but when you have um, you, your lab science and hopefully you can even do animals, but then also have access to patients. And then look what you propose mechanistically. Can you at least look at from an association that this is really happening in a disease? And then hopefully you get a, a collaborator and you can even uh, be part of an intervention study. And, uh, and then if you um, get together with an epidemiologist, maybe they start asking those questions in the population. Okay, good. Thanks. Thanks for listening. <laughs> you have questions? Uh-huh, please. Uh, like, uh, in our study, it was the opposite. We knew that if a man has a uh, genitectomy, one or more. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We don't, we don't, we don't want to decide by this paper. This is what we did in our question about the nuclear agent. You would not have it. You mean uh, what you would have? Um, you would not know that uh, what you would have is that your person is not even regulated. So you do epidemiologist questionnaire, and you know they are regulated. So I'm hoping to get an answer in this report. I know. <laughs> yeah, I can't take that first. No, 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 maybe no. Um, another question. What about exercise? Uh, in, in, in camp. Yeah, certain, yeah, for certain camps, of sure, uh, people recommend to exercise. Um, um, physical activity is, 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 you know, but it's to start it out in, in, in a uh, overweight and um, um, you know, obese year, so yeah, that's, that, that's what you would say. It's, that's not really the topic. Uh, it's what relates to that you develop um, the overweight or obese and then exercise, that actually exercise is in, 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 in some cases more attractive than just losing weight. It's just that it's related. When people have looked at it and looked back, uh, um, you know, it's obviously easier to get out exercise and they find out, you know, when you have the food, when you have exercise, there's better protection to exercise more. The same is true also with um, 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 comorbidity, like with diabetes or metabolic syndrome, we have a type one for that type of area. And we looked at the relationship between BMI and postural body factor and so on. Uh, you have always in your obese condition, and you have the, uh, um, uh, 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 you don't have metabolic syndrome, you should, you know, you consider a nice job that has no, no disease risk. But you have diabetes and all kinds of people, that's what they do. So it's clearly the comorbidity that are driving. And comorbidity is, you know, for those when you see insulin, insulin like growth factor. Uh, uh, um, and there are clear mechanisms behind it that we understand uh, that should cause them to increase risk of disease in the we looked at start out with, 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 with BMI and weight. It's easy to measure, and now they have to go back and do physical research. And then, based on physical research, that's why you make then the decision how to uh, um, intervene. You know, what are your recommendations? And so, so it's, it's a pretty easy uh, study to follow. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.
Okay, Stefan, we'll have to move on. Good questions. <laughs> Thank you. And Dave Wiggs going to talk about biochemistry. Looks like he stepped out of the room for a second. <laughs> He's having a busy day. He just got back in town. There he is. <laughs> Come on, Dave. <laughs> if you want to highlight some parts of your talk, please use the mouse to apply. Okay. Well, um, now for something completely different. <laughs> We're going to continue today 
uh, with today's lecture about more of the vocabulary, what actually makes up the redox biology. Last time I talked, to, I think it was a week or two ago, we talked about the chemistry, you know, the fundamental chemistry. And like you see with Stefan's talk, things get very confusing when you start going into deeper and deeper into biology because, frankly, every cell has redox biology. So you don't know if the ROS is good or bad, and everything is compartmentalized. So let's go back to let's go back to some of the biochemistry here. Sorry, I was late today. Uh, Two seventy was a little slower than I anticipated, as usual. <laughs> I should do better at that. I thought going the other way was going to be a little easier. But what we're going to talk a little bit about today is where do we get the these? Uh, what are the, some of the sources of the radicals? Uh, what are some of the exogenous sources? Uh, versus the endogenous, such as some of the enzymes, the critical enzymes, and we'll touch on some of their mechanisms today. Also, one of the important thing, aspects of redox biology is the fact is how do you detoxify? Just like any signaling phosphorylation, you also have dephosphorylation. Well, in the case of redox, you have to have antioxidant uh, enzyme systems, which are often much more effective than antioxidants themselves. And they play critical roles because they can actually be compartmentalized. So we'll talk a little bit about that chemistry today. So the formation of oxidants. We generally think of hydrogen peroxide as the quintessential agent that starts everything. We talked about the chemistry of this, the Fenton reaction, the oxidative stress. And in this case here, we have things like NADPH oxidase. I think Tom Lato is going to talk about this later on. This is a very important enzyme, not only as an antimicrobial and antibacterial, but it's also there are other isoforms that are critical in signaling, and we'll, we'll touch on that a little bit today. Xanthine oxidase, it was an old enzyme. People were really excited about it in the 70s and 80s. And what it basically does is it can generate hydrogen peroxide from purines. And then the polyamine oxidase, this is coming up again. When we start talking about metabolism, Everybody's interested now in metabolism, <clears throat> and in particularly the polyamines. At the end of the polyamine cycle is polyamine oxidase, which is also a source of hydrogen peroxide. And we're first going to talk about xenobiotics today. How do we how do we get like chemical toxins? How do we get to ROS? And then of course, when you oxidize, you get oxidation, like in the chemistry we talked about previously. We actually get lipid hydroperoxide, oxidized proteins, and of course, glutathione. Well, on the other side of this is the antioxidant system, catalase, GPX, uh, prolohydroxylase. These are, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, reduction. These are actually critical in regulating the oxidative stress here. And of course, glutathione here with GSSG and of course, the conversion back to GSH. Thyroreduxin, we'll, talk, we'll touch on that. Thyroreduxin is critical. If you knock out thyroreduxin in many systems, this is what maintains your self-hydro groups. They then become very susceptible to oxidation, and you get over-oxidation, which can cause apoptosis and other, uh, and other um, oxidative stress-related death. Of course, we have nitric oxide synthase. I have to admit, this is my favorite one in the there, nitric oxide synthase, of course, makes NO. If it's uncoupled, it does not have arginine or tetrahydrobiopterin. It can actually generate superoxide. So it can be both an NO producer and also a peroxide uh, um, generator as well. So NO, as we talked about, can also be an antioxidant. And a lot of times what we found in this system here, and we'll touch a little bit upon it a little bit later, is that NO can actually abate oxidative stress, and oxidative stress can abate NO. And this is actually critical in the signaling of these two uh, redox species. And one of the chief scavengers of NO, of course, is oxyhemoglobin. This is like the black hole for nitric oxide. Nitric oxide, it actually reacts with oxyhemoglobin. This is why it doesn't just spread across your body. Also, cells can consume nitric oxide very effectively as well. So with this all in mind here, we have, we have both the instigators, productions of these re redox reactions. We also have a many antioxidant and consumption mechanisms that regulate this system. So back to the original thing where we were talking about electron transfer. 
the fundamental determination of whether we're going to see something <coughs> generate hydrogen peroxide is the fact is, can electron reduce the superoxide? And then does the ox superoxide, can that be then reduced to H2O2? And you can see this is an uphill reaction because it has a negative voltage. And that downhill reaction, once you form superoxide, to make hydrogen peroxide. One other feature of this is that when oxygen forms HO2, this is actually more reactive than O2 minus. This is critical in organelles like the mitochondria, where you have proton flux, and that the formation of this HO2 can actually be much more powerful reductant. So what about things that can make superoxide? Methylbiologin, this is my postdoc, this was our quintessential thing. If we could make blue, because we're so afraid of oxygen, if it went clear, we went, oh my God, my protein's dead. Six months of work, right down the tube. So that was my first experience with methylbiologin. But of course, paraquat is a known toxin, a lung toxin. And you, it takes methylbiologin here, you, plus oxygen, if you reduce it, it has enough reductive potential to make superoxide here. So it becomes an ROS generator. Other compounds that do this and <coughs> are the quinones. And this is ubiquinone, which is at site three in the mitochondria, menadione, which is vitamin K, uh, doxorubicin, which is an um, anti-neoplastic agent, and tocopherol, which is a water-soluble vitamin E. And the fundamental thing about quinones I know this chemistry is not nearly really exciting with whether you're going to die from tobacco smoke or not. <laughs> but this is actually a fundamental reaction here that goes on in the body. It's a common redox reaction. And so if you have quinone here, some quinones can actually become semiquinones. So you can reduce this to the semiquinone. And this is uphill. And if the potential of this is high enough, it can reduce oxygen to superoxide, or it can take superoxide into hydrogen, uh, in, I'm sorry, into hydrogen peroxide and make the diphenol. And so this quinone, semiquinone, diphenol is critical. And this is semiquinone, this radical species here is a reactive species. And it can react with GSH actually or other proteins here at a relatively reactive rate and inhibit these enzymes. Dopamine is also a quinone. Uh, catecholic estrogens. These all have re the same type of redox potentials, adrenaline, where you have an ortho group here. And again, you can make the semiquinone here. And this can be converted by putting one electron in and one electron in. You can actually generate the diphenol, quinone, or semiquinone. Vitamin K, the same thing. You, you have here a paraquinone here. And oxyhemoglobin has been known to actually Donate an electron, and you can generate superoxide, or you can react with thiols. Dopamine. Dopamine by itself, actually, its potential is high enough. It's not, it's in your brain. It's not really reacting with anything. But when it gets hydroxylated to L-dopa, or I'm sorry, 6-hydroxydopamine, it becomes redox active. And people have, have attributed uh, Parkinson's syndrome to this particular species here, the generation of the species here. So quinones, they have this both pro-oxidant and antioxidant property. And again, quinones, when we make the semiquinones, can drive the haber weiss reaction. In other words, we can reduce iron-3, which is really impervious to hydrogen peroxide to make hydroxyl radical. In fact, is it can reduce iron-3 to iron-2 to make it a pro-oxidant. Conversely, it can also make superoxide. So a lot of times we want to go from quinone to the diphenol species and skip this. And I'll talk a little bit about that later. The prooxidant, semiquinone to quinone. The antioxidant, which is semiquinone to the diphenol. And one of the things of understanding whether or not this is good or bad or, or regulating in a prooxidant or antioxidant is really is location and the pharmacological stability of, um, of these species here. Water versus fat soluble, that's also critical. The semiquinone or the quinone may not be as soluble as the diphenyl, quinone, uh, the diphenyl complex. So vitamin E, this is a, actually I think all the studies on vitamin E have been negative, is that true? 
Yeah, pretty much we were all we were all excited about vitamin E was going to cure us. Make my skin look really good, but I got really old. Didn't work. So, but anyways, it was all the rage in the 1990s. And one of the things is you have tocopherol. This is a vitamin E analog here. And you can take radicals, hydroxyl radicals, lipid radicals, even NO2, and you generate the tocopherol radical. Now, the good thing is, is that this is much less reactive than these species here. It's not likely to go on and modify DNA or modify proteins here. And things like uh, coenzyme Q from the mitochondria, the reduced form, can actually oxidize here to the semiquinone form and further get reduced. Another interesting thing is that it can, this uh, quinone, semiquinone here, can react with ascorbic acid to regenerate the original um, uh, decopherol here. So you actually set up a cycle with the ascorbic acid, which is now exchanging this radical here and ascorbic acid. Keratins, keratins have a very similar, similar effect. They're not quinones, but they can react with radicals here. And they form a, a polyunsaturated radicals here, which then can react with ascorbate here to form much more stable complexes. Now, how are some of these xenobiotics metabolized? Uh, Stefan actually mentions uh, NAP, uh, NADPH, ox, uh, I'm sorry, NADPH uh, quinone reductase, NQ1, um, versus the cytochrome P450s. Now, cytochrome P450s are these enzymes that have a reductase domain and a heme domain. And when they become uncoupled, the reductase domain can actually generate superoxide because the potential of the electron just kind of takes it away from there, from the flavins. And that ends up being one electron species, and you can generate superoxide and hydrogen peroxide from uncoupled uh, P450. And this was classically a way back in the 1970s and 1980s that people actually looked at this enzyme uh, and was thought to be toxic, actually one of the mechanisms that was thought to be toxic. But the one thing about the P450s we have to remember is they do a lot of things. And we'll talk a little bit about the enzymology, but they can make steroids. They can detoxify a lot of things. So they're quintessential. It's when they actually become uncoupled, such as things with chloroform and other, other, uh, uh, other xenobiotics, that this becomes a problem. So how do we detoxify a lot of this stuff? Well, detoxification of the quinones, the ones that we've been talking about in Paraquat, is actually by an enzyme, and uh, naphthalene, I'm sorry, it's a NADPH quinone reductase. And this is part of the P450 reductase system, or superfamily here. And what it simply does is it takes quinones and skips the radical step. So instead of putting one electron in, we actually put two electrons in. And that's like putting a hydrogen atom in, or a hydride in, okay? Just like NADPH will transfer to a hydride atom to it. This is the way Mother, Mother Nature really likes to do electron transfer. We try, Mother Nature tries to avoid putting one electron in and having potentially had that electron skip off to oxygen. So to avoid this problem, what we do is we transfer a hydride. And that hydride is this system here. And this is part of what we call the antioxidant responsive element, or the phase, the old term was the phase two enzymes. So the mitochondrial is the source of ROS. And at the mitochondria, you have site one and site two. There's some controversy of whether site one or site two can generate ROS. But the best established one is actually site three. And that site three is there's coenzyme Q which is a quinone. And what that can do is that can take, if it's uncoupled, can take oxygen into superoxide. And a lot of people believe this is the source of the so-called mitochondrial ROS. So if we look at this chemistry here, we got the quinone here. That can go to the semiquinone, which is slightly uphill here. That can come back and reduce back to superoxide. And depending on the proton flux inside the mitochondria, can actually generate HO2, depending on the pKa. The, the, the proton of the membranes can be as much as four to seven. 
And that's actually a mode of force for driving the ATP. One of the things that can also happen is that superoxide can react with the semiquinone and form this uh, phenol, which is kind of a dead end, but it's a much more stable compound here. So when, you, when the electron cannot get to site four, one of the things is nitric oxide can block this, cyanide can block this. A lot of things can block the oxygen from binding, here, binding to here and back up the electron flow, and then it just, and then it decouples. So the polarization, depolarization of the mitochondria can affect this proton gradient, which can, uh, it's very important in affecting the reduction of hot, uh, uh, superoxide. One paper that came out was actually looking at this in more detail, and they asked whether or not if you make the semiquinone here, how likely is it then to reduce the superoxide? And they did a very simple electron equation here. And what they determined is that the potential from here to here is actually uphill. And what they said is that this equilibrium here would lie 100 times in this direction. So it's not easy to generate free superoxide in the mitochondria. There's always this myth that superoxide is floating around. Well, it doesn't. As a matter of fact, people like Henry Foreman have gone in and measured this a long time ago. And they show that this is at femtomolar levels at best. And, but how we actually see superoxide is it can be trapped. It can be trapped by a spin trap. So it can be in this equilibrium here. It can generate hydrogen peroxide. But more importantly, manganese SOD. This was SOD2 that uh, Stefan showed earlier. This actually controls the superoxide and can convert it safely into H2O2, which then increases um, your oxidative capacity. NO can trap it here. One of the things of decoupling to make peroxynitrite, once you make peroxynitrite, it actually, in the presence of CO2, just rapidly goes to nitrate. So this is a way of bleeding off your electron flow from the site four. So it's not always straightforward how these systems actually work. It, you gotta actually kind of put it in the context of where the electron flow is. This is just an old uh, chemotherapeutic agent, bleomycin. This is an example of interspheral reduction of electrons. You have an iron three complex. Iron three doesn't really like to bind iron. Oxygen, like if you have met hemoglobin, you can't bind oxygen, right? That's the best way to think about that. But if you put an electron in there, if it's reduced by the cell, especially under you know, hypoxia and other things, then it, can then it can bind to oxygen. And once it binds to oxygen here, it produces fetin-like chemistry. Remember, we were talking about these feral and hydroxyl radical-like things. These are what can damage DNA. This is why it then damages the cell. The converse of this, this is how to cytotoxic, Prolohydroxylase, this is a critical enzyme. Um, it controls HIF-1 alpha. People who are interested in HIF, this is one of the critical things of controlling HIF stabilization. IKK beta is also controlled by prolohydroxylases. Also, everybody keeps forgetting, so is collagen. So collagen, prolohydroxylase, the hydroxylation of collagen is, determines how stiff collagen is. And this reduction in the electron is generally by ascorbic acid. So lack of vitamin C, scurvy, they have all sorts of problems. And this is the major cause of scurvy because we're not reducing our prolohydroxylases. But how prolohydroxylase works is that it forms this species here. This species is capable of hydroxylating proline in the, on the HIF. When it hydroxylates proline, it then makes it susceptible to the E3 ligase, which then consumes it. So as long as oxygen's there, HIF is not stabilized. Once you take oxygen away, you can't form this complex. It's then stabilized. P450s. This is a, one of the classic heme protein oxidants. It's kind of like, I always look at P450s as like putting a bomb in a box. If you take the heme out of there, the electron potential of the uh, P450s is way up there. It's like 1.8. Remember, hydroxyl radical is 1.9 to 2 volts. This is like 1.8. So it can hydroxylate anything. But because this box has certain shapes and certain ways of getting in, it oxidizes only specific substrate. So Mother Nature, of course, puts all these little bombs in like a nuclear reactor 
inside these beautiful proteins, which then allow only specific substrates. Well, how the redox reaction works is you have this resting state, the iron three, that is that actually you get an electron. Once you make the iron two, it allows oxygen to bind. You get further reduction, and you generate these uh, iron oxo species here, which actually are very powerful oxidants. They can hydroxylate substrates, they can oxidize substrates, and they they can actually then go back to the, when they have oxidized the substrate, they go back to the resting and they start over again. And so the reductase of this takes NADPH flavins, FMN, and pushes the electrons into the P450s. Quinones can decouple this and decouple this process here, stealing the electrons here, and in fact is reducing oxygen and decoupling. So any questions up to now? I, sorry, this is the boring part. Really bad at five o'clock. I have to. I get the boring lunch. I don't even have to talk about my stuff. But anyways, enzymatic generation of rea reactive oxygen species. What is the purpose of having reactive oxygen species? Well, primarily an antimicrobial. Interestingly enough, mice don't use ROS. When you're doing mice, you get data in mice. They tend to use more NO than they do ROS. And it's also a byproduct of metabolism. We always have this joke, that if you breathe, you have redox. Just by the virtue of breathing. They used to always say, because we are living and we're generating all these species here, we're irradiating ourselves because we can generate this. Eh, it's not quite true. Mother Nature is much smarter than that, but yeah. But the other critical thing that ROS has become, and probably as important as anything, is ROS is important in signal transduction mechanisms. So, where do they come from? Where does hydrogen peroxide come from? Well, you can go in the catalog and I want to generate hydrogen peroxide to my cells, right? Glucose oxidase is great because you actually directly produce hydrogen peroxide. You don't have the intermediacy of superoxide. Polyamine oxidase is, it's funny, we learned about this back in the 70s and 80s in metabolism. Didn't think much of it, but now it's coming back because the differentiation in polyamine pathway versus other arginase pathways. So this can generate H, H2O2 and putrescine. Xanthine oxidase, this is associated with a, you know, um, either generation of uh, urate. You have urate in your blood of 200 micromolar. And generating superoxide and H2O2 or hypoxanthine, which generates xanthine and H2O2 and H, I'm sorry, superoxide and H2O2. And of course, NADPH oxidase. So xanthine oxidase, the purpose of this is pure in purine metabolism, is to get rid of excess purines, it's secretion of milk droplets, detoxify, detoxification of aldehydes, and it generates ROS. Presumably, it's exported from the cell and it's part of the antimicrobial machinery. So xanthine, if it's xanthine dehydrogenase, simply converts purines um, like to uric acid and NADH. This is under normal conditions. And so we preserve the electron flux. But if we have a disease or injury, there's a um, protease that clips the dehydrogenase and generates xanthine oxidase and you generate superoxide and H2O2. Hypoxia will do this. So during ischemia reperfusion injury, xanthine, ox xanthine dehydrogenase will then be converted into xanthine oxidase to generate hydrogen peroxide, because if you think about it, it's the bio, biological quick disinfectant. I mean, when you get a cut, what do we do? I dump hydrogen peroxide on there. And so that's one of the ways that we do things. So um, how does it work? This is, a, this is actually kind of a unique enzyme here. It's got a molybdenum center. Not many enzymes have a molybdenum center. I have to admit, I did my postdoc in molybdenum enzyme. So kind of biased towards molybdenum. Well, basically what happens is this molybdenum cofactor here takes a hypoxanthine or xanthine, binds to the molybdenum, it's converted to urate, <coughs> and then is then it's capable of reducing FAD to FADH2. Once you do this, then oxygen can come in and can be reduced to superoxide, or if the oxygen stays in that pocket long enough, and they're lower oxygen tensions, 
It actually goes directly to H2O2 before it comes out of the pocket. So this enzyme has the capacity, depending on how much oxygen there and whether it's the electron flux, of generating both superoxide and H2O2. So if a lot of people use this in your cell media to generate ROS. It's a classic way of doing it. What Under those conditions, you generate about 20% superoxide and about 80% H2O2, just for your reference. Um, any DPH oxidase? And again, I'll leave this to Tom Leto. He's going to give a nice lecture later on. Uh, NADPH, it's antimicrobial. Uh, that's one of its biggest function here. It regulates cell surface signaling, and it's a regulation of physiological functions. It's a really important class of enzymes. Uh, there is a lot, there's several different uh, isoforms here, and I didn't include them all here, but uh, NOx1, 3, 4, and 5 are generally thought to be more regulatory. Two is actually part of the innate immune system. Membrane bound, this is where it's produced, these ROS are produced in the membrane. The big player is GP91 uh, FOX and P21, but there's regulators that all have to come together in the cytoplasm in order to uh, activate this enzyme. So it's a very highly controlled enzyme. And if we look at this, this is, what ha this is actually what's happening in the, in the membrane. These are two iron centers here. And those iron centers can transfer electrons directly through outer sphere electron transfer to oxygen to generate superoxide. This is the GP91 FOX system here. But it, in order for this to take place, it has to and facilitate this FAD. You have to have P21, RAC, GP67, P4, P40, and P47. If you knock one of those out, in many cases, you reduce the NADPH oxidase activity. Nitric oxide synthase. Nitric oxide synthase has emerged as one of the big players of physiology. Again, they gave the Nobel Prize in 1998 for its regulation of the endothelial, um, the endothelium and cardiovascular. Since then, it has exploded into, I think, just about every aspect of biology. It was, as I said, this is one of the biggest fields. If you do the uh, phosphoric omic, and then you compare that to something like nitric oxide, you'd see there's about 170,000, maybe even more than 200,000 for nitric oxide and only about 250 to 300 for the kinome. So it's, but then you put ROS on that and actually the redox field is much bigger than the kinome. So it's impressive. This is, the redox and the kinome actually, you can't dissociate them. It's like taking the wires out of the phone box, right? I can try to disconnect it here or here, but each one of those is actually essential for the shape of the phenotype of the biology. Anyways, enough philosophy, enough philosophy here. Okay, so we have two, NOS1, NOS3. In the old days, we called this neuronal NOS because it was first discovered with um, neurons and regulates many of the calcium channels. ENOS, this is uh, the endothelial nitric oxide, which actually was how nitric oxide was actually discovered as a regulator. Remember, nitric oxide is a radical, so it was very surprising that it was actually being generated endogenously to regulate so many things. And then INOS. INOS is actually, um, it's calcium insensitive, and it generates a lot of NO. In mirroring systems, it can generate the equivalent of, oh, five micromolar for days. So it can produce a flux of five micromolars per day. That's like dumping 10 millimolars of an NO donor. It's a lot of nitric oxide. And its primary use probably is in antipathogen response. One thing it has, it, unlike P450s, it has a P450 reductase domain that's actually attached to the protein. So in the P450 systems, you have to recruit the reductase domain to the enzyme. That's how it's regulated, a lot of it. If it's dissociated, it can become a redox regulator this way. But in the, in, the, in the NOS, it actually has to bind, it's actually part of the protein structure, uh, the primary structure. And it has a heme domain, just like P450, which oxidizes arginine to uh, NL. So this is kind of how it works. There's a, it's regulated by a calmodulin uh, domain. And if this is the monomer, it's interesting, the electrons don't come from this way, 
but actually the electrons come from the other. It's a homodimer here, and the electron flow has to go from one dimer to the other. And that's kind of how it's actually controlled. And when you disturb this structure here, you actually uncouple the NOS. So you decrease the NO, and people speculate, and they've shown that actually this now becomes an ROS generator. So the, the formation of this structure here is critically important in determination of whether you get NO or you get ROS. Remember, NO's critical regulatory function is binding to a heme protein called guanylate cyclase. And that forms cyclic GMP. And cyclic GMP is a major signaling pathway, like cyclic AMP, in many cells. NOS biology. So the biochemistry of this is fairly complicated. Uh, it's been argued that this is the most regulated enzyme there is. It's regulated both at the transcriptional level, it's regulated here biochemically, and it's tied into a lot of metabolic pathways such as oxygen, it's very sensitive to oxygen, and ADPH, and arginine, all these are required to generate nitric oxide. Cofactors like calcium tetrahydrobiopterin are critical, and it can be regulated by uh, post-transcriptionally by a number of different mechanisms, including phosphorylation. The products that come out are NO. You can measure the NO. But other products are N-hydroxyarginine, which is the intermediate product. And why that's important is that N-hydroxyarginine is critical in regulating arginase. I don't know if you guys remember arginase from your biochemistry, but it takes arginine into the polyamine pathway. So if you have a proliferating cell, it wants arginase to go and make polyamines to stabilize DNA. But if you have NOAA there, then it can't do that. It can generate superoxygen H2O2, and another one of our favorite compounds, HNO, which I don't have a lot of time to talk about here, uh, is possibly generated from the uncoupled uh, NOS protein here. One thing is, is that if you generate lots of NO, some of the isoforms here can actually, the NO can go back and bind to the P450. And what that actually does, it blocks the ability for oxygen to come back on to facilitate the reaction. Uh, the interesting thing is that there, each isoform has different susceptibilities here. The on rate for NO for um, INOS is fairly resistant compared to the constitutive. And also the oxygen, the binding of oxygen is really critical. And this was actually when the Dennis Stewart and his co-workers looked at this. And what they found was the KM for oxygen, I don't know if you remember what KMs are, but what that means is that how much oxygen do I get one half of the biochemical reactivity. So by using that, I say, OK, ENOS, I can drop the oxygen tension all the way down to 20 micromolar and still preserve 50% of my activity. And that's good, because you want your ENOS to work even as low, in low hypoxia, because you want it to generate NO to dilate your vessels. INOS, on the other hand, was very interesting. This you want to be able to produce high levels of nitric oxide, but you want to, do, you want to have it fairly resistant to hypoxia. And the most interesting and the one that we haven't figured out is NNOS. And that is very high KM. So in other words, at physiological concentrations, the enzyme activity is about a third of what it is. And what Dennis Stewart proposed was, is because the oxygen tension is linear throughout the physiological range, that NNOS was actually an oxygen sensor for different types of uh, neurochannels as well as cyclic GMP, um, uh, especially catecholamines and things like that. Heme oxygenase. So, sorry, stop me at any time, but I know we're flying through all these here. Again, this was a vocabulary, a language lesson day. So we have, do you have a question? I'm sorry. Oh, so we have heme oxygenase. So we've been talking about NO, ROS, but in the redox component, there's also carbon monoxide. The fact is, in carbon monoxide, it's very interesting because they actually, they actually get patients who are septic or in shock to breathe carbon monoxide, and it rescues them. They, small gases like nitric oxide, they've had babies breathe that, and it rescues them from hyaline membranes disease and other things. So there's actually, uh, there's actually a whole society about gases, small gas, reactive gas molecules that actually have therapeutic value. 
Well, in vivo, the, the generator of CO is from heme oxygenase. It basically consumes hemes and releases carbon monoxide, but it also releases bilirubin here. And the reason that that's important is bilirubin is a powerful antioxidant. Heme oxygenase is also associated with down regulation of the immune response. It's associated with things like IL-10. And the other thing it will release is also iron as well. And so CO, it's been a, even though we know it's active, we're not quite sure what it does. CO has been proposed to downregulate activated T cells, for instance. So it's a very important family. It's associated with a TH2 phenotype. These are the, the you have TH1, which is more pro-inflammatory, and TH2, which is more anti-inflammatory. And the bio, so does anybody have any questions on the enzymes? I know we're going through this. Okay, the biochemistry prevention of oxidative nitrosative stress. So we've talked about how we get these species. Now, how are they, how are they prevented? So we have preventive, so we want to inhibit the production of the ROS and uh, we and there are natural inhibitors and also synthetic inhibitors. We also, if we produce these ROS or NO, we'd like to be able to scavenge these reactive intermediates. And we want it to go to an innocuous um, product. We also want it to be able to be biologically recycled. And often, a lot of the things that happen with ROS are chain propagating, like lipid peroxidation. You want to be able to break those chains. So let's look at the uh, biochemistry of reactive oxygen species again. We have here xanthine oxidase or NADPH or NOS uncoupled, generate superoxide and ultimately hydrogen peroxide. And of course, like we talked about, this can dump into the Fenton reaction. This can go through lipid peroxidation here, which causes cell death. But hydrogen peroxide can also inhibit things like aconitase in the mitochondria and also other iron regulating proteins, COX-2 and uh, lipoxygenase. But also, it can modify, like Stefan was talking about, things like NF-kappa B, MAP kinase, and P53. Peroxide can also be converted by the peroxidases. These are things like myeloperoxidase and enosinophil peroxidase, which can react with chloride ion to make uh, HOCl, HOBr. Remember, this is the stuff you put in your pool or hot or spa for an antimicrobial. And also can oxidize nitrite to NO2. NO2 is actually really important in some um, pathogens such as TB. And so this reaction is actually very important in things like TB. So how do we prevent this? Well, superoxide formation to hydrogen peroxide. The consumption of uh, um, superoxide is by superoxydismutase. That's very fast. Once you make hydrogen peroxide, the catalase systems uh, uh, that are in the peroxisome or one of the chief regulators of H2O2 is glutathione peroxidases. The peroxy reductions, that, um, actually, Sugu Ri was one of the proponents of this. He actually used to work in this building here, and now he's in uh, Korea. But there are many isoforms here, and these tend to be in the membranes. This is regulating things, thioactivity in the membranes. And of course, if you produce lipid hydroperoxide, these can be controlled by the glutathione peroxidases, but also uh, depends on the location here, the mitochondria, peroxidome, and plasma. Nitric oxide, we have a little different story here. We have nitric oxide. NO at high enough concentration can inhibit respiration of these direct effects here. NO can activate guanylate cyclase. NO actually inhibits cytochrome P450 and the radical reaction. So these are actually require much lower concentrations of nitric oxide here. But as we increase the concentration of NL, such as during infection or the activation of INOS, we actually start seeing species like N203, NO2, peroxynitrite, which then these species here communicate depending on the amount of NO, and all can be converted to NO2 and N203, facilitating nitrosative reactions that we talked about last time. And we think that this, is, this milieu here is really a component of the anti-tumor, but also anti-pathogen response. The scavenging of NO, how do we regulate it? Well, the chief regulator are these are hemoglobin and myoglobin. If NO is made, it's compartmentalized because as soon as it diffuses to the bloodstream, 
uh, red blood cells are literally like the black hole for NO. It reacts so fast. Uh, cellular consumption is another way. And the mechanism is yet to be determined here. But under oxidative stress, these iron oxo species can consume NO to make nitrite. These, these species here are really critical because NO is fairly unreactive. Contrary to popular belief, it's actually quite unreactive. You can buy a tank of it. If you keep it away from oxygen, it can stick around forever. Matter of fact, if you go into intracellular space, nitric oxide and HNO, the second and third most common, ele uh, sorry, common molecules you see in intracellular space. So it's fairly, fairly uh, stable. But in the presence of biological systems, you have oxygen, but you also have a lot of other mechanisms to compartmentalize its signaling. The biochemistry of glutathione peroxidase. If you take glutathione peroxidase out of this is a this is a cytosolic, uh, and I'm sorry, cytosolic enzyme which is critical in controlling cellular hydrogen peroxide. So NADPH again uh, can facilitate the um, conversion of GSSG back to GSH. If you have proteins um, such as you know this, uh, you have a selenium protein here. It reacts with the selenium OH molecule here. So GPX reacts, is a selenium protein. It reacts with this uh, to form this selenium um, hydroxide species, which then reacts with GSH. The GSH reacts with that, and then the glutathione reductase then reduces it back. I don't know if I was very clear about that, but this, this actually can, is a very efficient way with glutathione reductase and glutathione peroxidase to actually maintain the cellular redox of GSH, GSH and GSSG ratio. Peroxy redoxins, these are similar, but they are thiol species. Many of them are dithiols here. And what happens is they react, these uh, peroxy reductions are often overexpressed in many cancers, breast cancer, uh, hepatocellular carcinoma, prostate, oral, and lung. And what they do is they react with hydrogen peroxide to form a disulfide bond here. And that disulfide bond, so it actually, the peroxide reacts, forms a sulfinic acid, and then that forms water. So it's taking hydrogen peroxide to water. And what happens here is thyroidoxin here, which is in this reduced state here, will then, ox I'm sorry, will re-reduce the protein back, and then thyroidoxin reductase will actually cycle back here consuming an ADPH. So this is a way of maintaining uh, with the um, peroxides, the um, either lipid peroxide or hydrogen peroxides, um, uh, reducing the oxidative stress. But what I want to point out too is pro when in signaling, especially membrane signaling, peroxy reductions are actually critical in maintaining signaling because many of the signals that we use ROS for, either lipid hydroperoxide or hydrogen peroxide, actually are controlled by these peroxy reductions. So, there's a, so this brings us to thyroidoxin. Again, well, we have glutathione. If you ever take in a cell, if you take a cell and you take all the glutathione out, they really, they really don't like it, and they actually die eventually because of the, they can't handle the oxidative stress. Well, the same thing here with thyroidoxins, where glutathione is sort of a general insulator against reactive species, the thyroidoxin is critical for taking proteins that were previously oxidized and re-reducing them. And if you look at this, this is um, thyroidoxin here, which is a disulfide here, and it is actually reduced by this thyroidoxin here, which actually is a selenium protein here. And this will take thyroidoxin if it's, it's let's say it's re-reduced like, sorry, We've gone from here to here. Now we need to reduce it back. If we can't reduce it back, we can't, we can't cycle through this. And so what happens here is thyroidoxin forms a sulfur selenium bond. Then it transfers an, to the uh, disulfide. Then the disulfide is back reduced by FADH. And then we just keep recycling back through this to preserve the sulfhydryl status of the proteins. And glutathione metabolism, again, we're talking about GSSG. If you take an oxidant, we talked about this, I think, in the first lecture, that anytime you have an oxidant, you end up with often GSSG. 
And when you get GSSG, cells don't like this. As a matter of fact, you can measure the oxidative stress by a chemical, chemical or other means by the levels of GSH versus GSSG. So if you have GSH and it encounters an oxidant, such as you form this radical, this radical species is immediately reacted with another GSH to form this radical. And then this radical can actually get re rapidly, um, um, I'm sorry, rapidly oxidized to superoxide. And we have SOD in the, in the cytoplasm, which is uh, SOD, copper zinc SOD, which makes peroxide. And then peroxide reacts with GPX, which we just talked about, to, uh, to water. So this is actually a very intricate but very efficient way of taking any oxidant that oxidizes GSH. You form these radicals here. These radicals are then um, form superoxide. But because we have high copper zinc SOD in the cytoplasm, we go to peroxide and then H2O2. GSSG is then restored with glutathione reductase. This, if GSH is in low concentration, you can form these radicals here, but you ultimately get again to GSSG. And that just simply cycles back here like this. So the glutathione system is actually very efficient at getting rid of things like ROS and other oxidants. Nitrosate of stress abatement. There are a number of different pathways here. NO can react with oxygen to form N2O3. Actually, that's not true anymore, but I won't go into that here. <laughs> but you form, you form these nitrosative species here, and you can form GSNO. And these s nitrosothiols actually, if it's on proteins, have been implicated in signaling. There's a lot of debate about this. But they can modify either proteins, um, protein thiols. Um, but GSNO, the question is, what happens to it? It can, be, it can form GSH and NO. Uh, if you, uh, with copper zinc SOG, GSNO can react with another GSH to form this molecule HNO. HNO reacts with another GSH, and we can ultimately form sulfinamide. Or this compound here, enough GSH, sorry about this. This is, again, more vocabulary here, but this forms GSSG, which now goes back to our glutathione re uh, reductase to form GSH. And so there's, just as there is efficiency for, for, um, getting rid of um, oxidative species, there's equally efficient with a lot of the same enzyme systems to get rid of N2O3. Um, GSSG can, uh, and glutathione ascorbic pools can actually communicate. Uh, PDI, so the uh, protein disulfide isomerase, uh, can, actu um, can actually convert GSSG back into GSH and consume one ascorbic acid or GSS eight, I'm sorry, uh, the ascorbic radical here can actually reduce metals or it can be an antioxidant or it can be oxidized further here back to DH, uh, DH, I'm sorry, DHAD, which is the two electron oxidation species of uh, ascorbic acid here. This can then recycle back, GSH can come in, re-reduces to the protein di um, disulfide isomerase or gluto, uh, glutoredoxin here and then keep restoring this. So ascorbic acid can communicate. There was, if you look at the chemistry, you don't, ascorbic acid won't react with thiols. If you put them in a test tube, they don't really react. Or they might react over you know, months or days, but that's not biologically relevant. But by, by ha having these type of enzymes here, you can actually convert GSH pools and ascorbic acid pools back and forth in an anti antioxidant uh, system. Um, this is urate. Urate, if you've ever done any reactions with urate, urate is incredibly powerful antioxidant. If you have, if you take a Fenton reaction and you oxidize DNA and you see it all blows up the DNA, you put urate in there, you don't get that because it's a very powerful scavenger and it's in your blood about 200 micromolar. And so if you take xanthine, Again, we'll just go through this. You make uric acid here. But uric acid, you can see these hydroxyl radicals, the scavenging effect is like 10 to the ninth. NO2, which is one of the potential species of, uh, of um, things like uh, the, N, uh, the NO oxygen reaction or the um, proxy, um, um, proxy nitrite reaction. This is a very effective scavenger of NO2. So depending on its pH, again, its pK is 5.4, then 
this, these, these reactions are actually quite facile here. So one of the things is, is how is NO and ROS interacting? These, this was in the 1990s, some of our, um, some of the biggest debates that was happening is how does NO in, interact with ROS? Well, NO here, coming from NOS here, uh, can bind to hemes, but once it can re release these hemes, stimulating HO1, HO1 can actually down, down regulate NOS through the consumption of hemes. So just by regulating the heme pool, if you heme oxygenase also regulates NADPH oxidase. So upregulation of HO1 actually down regulates both NOS and NOx here. NO can block ferrochelatase if it's high enough. Ferrochelatase is really important because it needs to insert the iron into the porphyrins. If you don't have that, so there's these feedback mechanisms. If NO reacts with a, a O2 minus, SOD can react to form hydrogen peroxide, lipid hydroperoxide. Um, and also you can make RNOS to GSH and G, GSH. So there's actually this regulatory balance. And we always talk about this as NO, ROS, and iron. This is like a triad if we're trying to understand oxidative stress. One thing about all these enzymes, they all require oxygen. So when we're talking about redox, whether heme oxygenase, whether NOS, NOx, or xanthine oxidase, all of these require oxygen and they have, they're have they sensitive to oxygen tension. So, oh, sorry about that. Anyways, done. we're done. So anyway. Any questions for Oh, yes. Yeah. Yes. Right, but if you eat, if you eat too much red meat, I think it is. It's red meat that causes gout, doesn't it? Yes. Okay. And men. Oh, sorry, I didn't know that. And men. Jeez, we we get all the bad stuff. <laughs> but uh, no, yeah. If you get too high levels, you start precipitating it out. That's why it's really. It's interesting that 200 micromolar in the bloodstream and 200 micromolar of urate and ascorbic acid, which have very similar kinetics with all these reactive species, are present in the plasma. And I always look at that as sort of a way, because, a way of regulating ROS in the endothelium. And the reason that's important is ROS is critical in the adhesion molecules that are expressed to bring in leukocytes. And I think what happens, that serves as sort of this tonic level of any stray ROS getting away that shouldn't get away. It's kind of like a protection. So in gout, the uric acid crystallizes in yeah. the big toe. And it's very painful. Yeah, I heard that. Oh, I don't know. I, I, I'm just, oh, no, I know. I'm not buying that. I mean, <laughs> well, thank God it's in your toe and not, not in your head. You know, if you think about it, that'd be a stroke, right? <laughs> no, come on, you sleep eight hours a day. Well, some of us do, right? <laughs> okay, we've had good questions and answers today. Thank you. All right, thanks. <laughs>